As Muhammad V was doing his best to establish and win the peace for the Kingdom of Granada, Peter I of Castile was doing just the opposite. The King of Castile would be engaged in an almost constant state of war from the time of his ascension in 1350. He would fight Aragon, the French, and even his own brother. But before we can truly judge him and determine if he actually lived up to the name Peter the Cruel, it should be noted that the seeds for his belligerent career were sown much earlier. You see, the way it worked out was that his father, Alfonso XI, was not just one of the more aggressive Castilian kings in history, but was also a man who was very adept at siring children. In 1334, Alfonso's wife, Maria of Portugal, gave birth to Peter I. With that whole male heir thing out of the way, Alfonso decided to take on a mistress, and for the record, he wasn't exactly shy about showing her off. She was a noblewoman that had descended from the aristocracy of what was once the Kingdom of Leon. Her name was Eleanor de Guzman. As can be imagined, Alfonso's wife, Maria, was not exactly happy with the idea of her husband running off into the arms of another woman. And when that other woman, again Eleanor, gave birth to a child, that is, his child, well that for the queen was just no good. I could also see Maria being upset when Eleanor gave him his second child and then the third. When he got up to five children, and I'm guessing here, Maria was probably really angry. I can only imagine what Maria must have felt when it got to number 10. Now if that doesn't breed resentment in a person, I'm not sure what would. When Alfonso XI died of the plague during his siege of Gibraltar, Maria's first act was to make sure her son was installed as the new king. Her second act was to round up Eleanor de Guzman, have her imprisoned, and then executed. I'll just leave it up to your imagination to determine what Maria did to her before she had Eleanor offed. However, Eleanor's children for the most part survived and in time would collectively be given the title the House of Trastamara. An agreement was reached where they could live peacefully alongside Peter, but these children too knew how to hold a grudge. The fourth child of Alfonso XI and Eleanor de Guzman was a man named Henry, known politically as Henry II. He was born the same year as Peter, and to be clear, he was actually a few months older, which could be argued that he was kinda more in line to be the next king. When he was older, he was made Count of Trastamara by his father, hence the derivation of the name that he would best be remembered by history, Henry of Trastamara. Almost immediately after Alfonso XI's death and the ascension of Peter I, Henry and his brothers began to rebel and gain supporters. This was the beginning of a civil war that would gain steam as time went on. And you can't really blame them. Henry and his side of the family were infused with both a desire to claim the throne and to revenge the execution of their mother. And they were fully committed. This was one of those go big or go home, that is in a body bag, kind of moments. His rebellion was squashed quickly by Peter. But strangely enough, he was pardoned by the Castilian king only to rise up in rebellion again. Henry would flee to Portugal and then to France. Each time he did this, again strangely enough, he was pardoned over and over only to rise up in revolt over and over. However that said, with each reiteration he would learn and more importantly would seek out and gain new allies for his cause. And it wasn't just that he was good looking or charismatic or knew what to say, he was very lucky. The political scene in Europe at that time in history just happened to be ripe with opportunity. Now to really comprehend what happened next, one must have an understanding of the insanely complex system of politics that existed not just in Iberia but in Western Europe. And I'll be the first to admit that I can't even begin to give this true justice, but for the sake of clarity, there were three major fights that were occurring, each at a different level of Zoom. At the grandest level, England and France, with respective allies, were engaged in the Hundred Years' War. And for the record, despite its namesake, this war started in 1337 and would go on for 116 years, 4 months, 3 weeks, and 4 days. This was a conflict that was so long that historians had to divide it up into segments of time named after respective kings. 
the Edwardian phase, the Lancastrian phase, etc. England at this point had given France two black eyes, first by defeating them at the Battle of Crecy in 1346, and then again at the Battle of Poitiers in 1356. But France was still powerful and very much in the fight, so both sides were looking for new allies to help in the conflict and to geographically outflank their opponent. They were going to find some really good opportunity for this in the Iberian Peninsula. On the next level of Zoom, you had the war between Castile under Peter I and Aragon under Peter IV, which started in 1356. This was aptly known as the War of the Two Peters. It was a grinding border conflict that drained the resources of everyone involved. And just the same as England and France, both Castile and Aragon were looking for someone to ally themselves with. Now, on the highest level of Zoom, you had the above-mentioned ongoing fight that was the War of Succession between Peter and his half-brother Henry Atrastamata, known as the Castilian Civil War. Like I said, the whole thing was a complicated mess, and this is how it played out. By 1356, Peter I had secured his hold on the Castilian throne, and had managed at least for the most part to keep his half-brother Henry somewhat under control. With this lull in the Castilian Civil War, Peter I decided to take on his neighbor to the east and invaded Aragon, which, if you recall, was under the rule of Peter IV. Again, this was known as the War of the Two Peters. This conflict was characterized by daring raids, the rapid capture of forts and castles, but then interspaced by truces that essentially just reset the board. For example, Castile invaded in 1357 and then again in 1361. In both campaigns, it would claim territory in some relatively minor towns, only to give them back via treaty for other concessions. The indecisiveness was grating, and it looked as if the War of the Two Peters was going to become a war of attrition. Thus, in 1362, the Castilian king, who desperately wanted to break the deadlock, allied himself first with Navarre and then later with both England and Portugal. Then, without a formal declaration of war, he launched a full-scale invasion. The King of Aragon was blindsided. When the invasion happened, he was off conducting business in France. Some historians felt that he was trying to establish an alliance with the French in order to strengthen his own position, and perhaps his plan was to launch a sneak attack against Castile. His timing, however, was really bad. Aragon was caught with its proverbial pants down. Castilian forces overran the border and began to take one city after the next. They were so successful that by the next year, they invaded what was known as the Kingdom of Valencia and took the strategic port of Alicante. Peter IV of Aragon desperately needed to reverse the situation and invoked the old adage, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. If Castile was allied to England, well then, Aragon would be tied into the French, who were themselves looking for partners. Remember, the Hundred Years' War was still far from over. Then the Aragonese king, invoking Machiavelli's line, never do your opponent a slight injustice, would begin negotiations with Henry of Trastamara, who was looking for a way to get back at his half-brother, and readily agreed to an alliance as well. Thus, the personal fight between Peter I of Castile and his brother, Henry of Trastamara, had now become a portion of a vast international fight. And make no mistake, both sides of this ever-growing system of alliances were gonna bet big on who was gonna win this personal fight between the two Castilian brothers. In 1366, Henry of Trastamara, who was reinforced by Aragon, who in turn were backed up by the French, opened up a new front and invaded Castile with his own army. His deft maneuvering completely took his half-brother by surprise. Peter was forced to flee, first to Galicia and then to the English-held city of Bayonne. The shock and awe tactic of Henry had worked perfectly. Peter had lost his throne, his allies began to desert him, and even Muhammad V of Granada, his friend, vassal, ally, and architectural soulmate, had defected to the Trastamata side, truly a low point for Peter. But there was still one who would back him up, 
Edward of Woodstock, known as the Black Prince, also known as the King of England, could not afford to lose the Iberian front to Aragon, who was allied to France, his long-term enemy. Edward, after all, had been at the Battle of Crecy and was the victor of the Battle of Poitiers. In both engagements, he had crushed the French, and I would argue that he rather enjoyed it. The man was known for his bellicosity. Therefore, losing was not something he truly relished, especially not to the French, or for that matter, their allies. Taking out a lot of loans, the English king decided to help put Peter I back on the Castilian throne. Peter, in turn, agreed to give him lands, secure trade routes, and most importantly, repay the insane amount of money that was borrowed. An army of approximately 10,000 men comprised of European mercenaries, English soldiers, and long bowmen was assembled. Then Peter and Edward marched their way through Navarre, picking up more allies before going on the offensive into Castile. When Henry of Trastamara was alerted to this incoming force, he rallied as many troops as he could and brought in his best commanders. This included a Breton knight by the name of Bertrand du Guesclin. Henry was outnumbered nearly two to one, but masterfully used guerrilla-style tactics to harass and disrupt his brother's army. He was able to inflict a lot of casualties with his hit-and-run tactics, especially on the English. However, despite his attempt to avoid a direct confrontation and whittle down his enemy as best he could, on April 3, 1367, he had no other choice and both forces finally engaged one another at the Battle of Najera. This would turn out to be a gruesome fight with extensive casualties on both sides. But in the end, Henry was soundly defeated and his army was nearly destroyed. Even his best commander, the aforementioned Bertrand du Guesclin, was captured. But ironically enough, this was to prove more costly for Peter. When the dust had finally settled from this confrontation, both Peter and Edward began to ask their subordinates had Henry been somehow killed or apprehended. To their shock and utmost dismay, the answer was no. Not only did Henry of Trastamara manage to escape, but he made it all the way back to France where he would rebuild his army and live to fight another day, thus assuring the fact that the Castilian Civil War would simply have to continue. For the time being, however, Peter I retook the throne of Castile and was able to re-establish ties with Granada. Muhammad V, seeing Peter's success, changed sides once again and became his vassal. The Sultan of Granada, being a bit of an opportunist, even made it a point to attack and capture, that is, for himself, Castilian cities like Jaén, Ubeda, and Baeza, which at the time were still holding out against Peter's re-established rule. For the purposes of a good PR, the Sultan sold this maneuver as neutralizing the rebel scum that was opposing the new ruler and the Castilians completely bought into it. And so Granadan forces would pour over the Castilian border, where they managed to capture a lot of territory. Indeed, Muhammad V even came within a hair's breadth of retaking Cordoba. Peter I of Castile really didn't seem to mind. He did, after all, have his crown back. But while he had regained the throne, holding on to it was going to prove to be really difficult. First and foremost, he had no money in the treasury and could not exactly pay the King of England back. That sum, by the way, was enormous and it would ruin Edward. Suffice it to say, the alliance between Castile and England came to an end. Peter was now politically isolated, but he was losing even more on the home front. Professor Catlas explains, quote, The length and cost of the war pushed his kingdom further into debt, sapping Peter's already flagging popularity. The increasingly unstable king inflicted his subjects with ever more burdensome taxes and tortured and executed anyone suspected of disloyalty, including members of his own family. Soon, he faced open revolt by his own nobility and the major towns of the realm." End quote. It was argued by historians that Peter during this time earned his title, Peter the Cruel. He would literally have people who were, quote, disloyal brought before him and executed in front of everyone. And this would include several members of the House of Trastamara, that is, his other half-brothers. But while Peter was slowly losing his grip on his kingdom and some would argue his mind, Henry of Trastamara was busy preparing for round two, 
In 1369, Henry had rebuilt his army and then made a formal alliance with France, who supported him with additional military force. Then, with his second wind, he invaded Castile once again. Bertrand du Guesclin, again his best commander, who at this point had ransomed his way back to freedom, decided to join Henry on the march. I guess in the end, the Breton knight had a score to settle himself. In response, Peter rushed to mobilize his own army. The English, who did not want to be outdone by the French, grudgingly sent in troops. And even Granada provided some military force. On March 14, 1369, the two armies met at what would be known as the Battle of Montel. It was once again brother versus brother, backed up by France and England, respectively. The fight was absolutely dreadful, but this time it was Peter who would lose ground and watch his army disintegrate. Towards the end, it was said that only the Knights of Granada were left to defend him. Henry had emerged victorious, and in a reverse of their prior engagement, Peter now had to run for his life. The Castilian king, with very few options, fled the battlefield and took shelter in the nearby castle of Montiel. But he was quickly pursued, surrounded, and then cut off by Bertrand du Guesclin. After a few days of seeing that he was trapped, Peter sent out a messenger to Bertrand to see if the Frenchman could be bribed. The offer was very generous, but Bertrand needed a moment to think about it. Finally, after giving it due consideration, he took the offer to Henry of Trastamara and said, This cowardly King Peter is trying to bribe his way out of a bad situation. How could anyone with any honor possibly accept this? Of course, towards the end of their conversation, Bertrand added, Well, can you beat this? So a message was sent back to Peter trapped in his castle with a plan. The plan was for Peter to come down from his battlements and to meet up with Bertrand in a tent to start negotiations or some would call this bribery. Either way, Peter readily complied, walked in, and began to shake hands with the Frenchman, offering him great terms. But just a few moments after Peter had come in, Henry of Trastamara entered the tent as well. That look of knowing one has been completely betrayed began to cross Peter's face, and he knew then and there that this was going to end badly. All of those years of hatred, of fighting both on and off the battlefield, the animosity of the two brothers were etched like scars into their faces. Chris Lowney in his book, A Vanished World, gives one account, there are others which are more dramatic, of what happened next. Quote, Late one night in March of 1369, Count Henry of Trastamara entered the tent of his estranged half-brother, King Peter of Castile. So much time had passed since their last meeting that Henry first had to verify with a retainer that the man standing before him was indeed his brother, Peter, the king. When this was verified, Henry pulled out a dagger, lunged forward, and stabbed Peter in the face, wounding him again and again and again. The monarch crumpled to the ground, but Henry continued his attack. When this was over, Henry immediately assumed Castile's throne as King Henry II. His brother's bloated, stinking corpse lay unburied and untended for three days before Henry permitted burial. Such are the bloody roots of the Trastamara dynasty." End quote. The Castilian Civil War had finally ended. The Trastamara dynasty had begun. And mark my words, this dynasty would have an incredible impact not just on Castile, but the entire world. The political landscape was now drastically different. The Christian kingdoms had severely battered each other down and they were not yet done fighting. Meanwhile, Muhammad V continued his long reign and tried his best to stay out of any conflict. Granada was enjoying a time of great prosperity. A prosperity, mind you, that was not won by war, but rather by the Sultan's astounding diplomacy. Muhammad V had managed to stay out of the fighting in Iberia as much as possible, and at the same time he managed to keep his neighbors in North Africa happy with skillful negotiations. The Sultan had essentially won the peace, and his kingdom showed it. The attitudes of the various countries were now somewhat reversed. In the wake of Peter the Cruel's death, both Aragon and Castile, which was now under the Trastamara dynasty, 
would now vie with one another to have Granada as an ally. And what made this whole situation even more plausible was that at the time, neither kingdom had the military capacity to seriously threaten the emirate. Thus, with this newfound confidence, Muhammad V would actually expand his territory. He was able to retake border cities, recapture Gibraltar, and thereby assert Granada dominance over the strait, which, as can be imagined, did wonders for both trade and his economy. Muhammad V's reign marked the apogee of the Nasrid dynasty, and the kingdom of Granada would flourish in the midst of a golden age. But as I've said before, all golden ages, and this one was no exception, would come to an end. Upon the death of Muhammad V in 1391, the Nasrid dynasty would descend into a period of utmost turmoil. Muhammad V's son, Yusuf II, would reign for barely a year before being assassinated. And from that time onwards, internal discord would only increase as various factions attempted to gain power. It should be noted that the historical record of the Nasrid from the 15th century onward was very limited. This was a testament to a civilization that was going into a massive decline. The descendants of Muhammad V seemed to lack his diplomatic finesse, and as such, Granada would become entangled in various conflicts. And furthermore, the emirate's once strong leadership began to completely dissolve. Michael Berry, in his book An Homage to Al-Andalus, explains, quote, The final decades of Granada were a bewildering time of internal conflict. They were a revolving door for rulers with usurpations, abdications, murders, and incarcerations. There were eight rulers between 1417 and the beginning of 1464 with 15 separate reigns. Usurpation was the order of the day. One ruler, Muhammad IX, possessing a certain persistence, enjoyed four separate reigns." End quote. Things got so bad that at one point the powerful and aristocratic family, the Banu Saraj, also known as the Abin Sarahe, attempted to slowly subvert the government and come to power themselves. Now, according to legend, again, records were not exactly accurate, the Nasrid emir at the time, Abu Nasser Said, decided to finally deal with them. In 1462, he threw a major banquet for the Abin Sarahe family in the Alhambra. In fact, the hall where this banquet allegedly was held now bears their name. The Sultan decided to serve a light salad with some croutons, a fine entree, and a dessert that didn't have too many calories. After all, you gotta watch those calories. However, just as the meal was coming to an end, he ordered his soldiers to storm into the room, had all the doors to the chamber slam shut, and then proceeded to give the command to have nearly the entire family executed, basically where they sat. And this is how it was. Blood would flow in the swan song years of the Nazareth as those that remained fought viciously to stay in power. Now, surprisingly, with so much internal disintegration, Granada continued to exist, or I should say, persist, albeit a shadow of her former self. But a big part of why Granada managed to survive this time period and avoid being completely wiped out had more to do with the fortunes of Castile. Castile had a difficult time after Henry II came to power and established the dynasty of the Trastamadas. The transition was a period of instability which was made worse by the fact that the first several kings of this new dynasty did not stay in power for very long. As a result, the need to complete the Reconquista was essentially put on the back burner, but that doesn't imply that this was a time of peace. By the early 15th century, in the wake of Muhammad V's death, the relationship between Castile and Granada would degrade. Hostility and open warfare would begin again and again between the two as treaties were established and then promptly broken. It was as Professor Catlas would describe as a hot peace. He explains it as such, quote, The 15th century was for the most part an era of small-scale raiding rather than campaigns of conquest. Raids were usually undertaken as independent initiatives by Christian and Muslim border lords, sometimes in breach of established treaties. At other times, common folk struck out a mere opportunity, waylaying merchants, capturing herdsmen, and rustling livestock. 
However, the various kingdoms went to great lengths to prevent this sort of illegal activity, especially the kind that might damage the flow of trade, disrupt the transit of herds who pastured on both sides of the frontier, spark violent reprisals, or justify the annulment of a truce." End quote. This is not to say that Castile was entirely weak or could no longer go on the offensive. During the reign of John II, who came to power in 1406 when he was just a year old and lasted until 1454, Castile would become a forerunner in the use of artillery, which he would use to devastating effect. It should be pointed out that many of the defensive positions in the emirate that were previously impregnable were now no longer capable of holding out in the face of Castilian firepower. For example, in the year 1410, the city of Antequera and the rich farmland it owned was taken by force for good. This would turn out to be a severe blow for Granada's economy, and in the subsequent decades, several other border cities would also exchange hands. But despite these advances, the Castilian rulers seemed to lack the nerve for a full-blown invasion. Indeed, when Castilian forces would invade deeper into Granada, they'd be pushed back or destroyed entirely. Granada, wrecked as it was internally, still had the capacity to hold her own. Granada and Castile were entering into very uncertain times. Again, very little is known about Granada, but in Castile we have a much better idea of what happened. When John II died in 1454, Castile would descend into a very tumultuous time. Henry IV would come to power, who initially thought of himself as being this great crusader king. However, in reality, he would prove to be both weak and indecisive on the offensive against the emirate. And if you were to ask the question, well, just how bad was he? Well, in time, he was given the title, the impotent. And this didn't have to do with just his poor military prowess. It was rumored that he not only lacked the ability to sire a child, but that his daughter and heir were not really his. As a result, his nobility rose up against him, proclaimed his brother Alfonso, the Prince of Asturias, as heir, and civil war broke out once again as Castile spun into another succession crisis. The once mighty kingdom now began to collapse into a very dark time. The conquest of the Kingdom of Granada would be deferred once again. It would seem that Castile would just never have the right kind of king to complete the Reconquista. The emirate, wrecked internally as it was, would still continue to exist. And taking that line from the Nazgul King from Tolkien's Lord of the Rings trilogy, Granada could stare down the kings of Castile and say, You fool, no man can kill me. And you have to admit the track record spoke for itself. Ferdinand III, who was arguably one of the greatest warrior kings, was able to take Cordoba and Seville, but then decided to keep the emirate around for the vast tribute. His son, Alfonso X, was too distracted trying to become the Holy Roman Emperor. Alfonso XI would come within an inch of finishing the Reconquista, but then was wiped out by the Black Death. Peter I just happened to like Granada too much and even put Muhammad V, who would rule during the Golden Age, back into power. And other kings would be born too young, die off too quickly, or like with Henry IV, would just not have the military stamina. But all of this would change on Henry IV's death in 1474. A new sovereign would come to power and would do what all the prior Castilian kings could not. In less than 20 years, Granada would finally crumble and fall. Al-Andalus, which had been around for over 800 years, would cease to exist. And the Reconquista would be decisively completed after an intense and bloody struggle. But that statement of the Nazgul king, you fool, no man can kill me, would still hold true. Because this new Castilian ruler wasn't a man, but a woman. And her name, in case you're wondering, was Isabella. <laughs>